Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. Today I continue my conversation with Scott Ford, the co-founder and CTO of Cogibytes, a company focused on modernizing legacy code. In the previous episode, Scott shared his interest in legacy code, the patterns he has seen evolve in solution development over the years, and about using the metaphors of archaeology and home renovation in the context of understanding and breathing new life into old software. And a lot more in this second part of the conversation scott shares the origins of his company corgi bites which has a focus on helping companies take something that already exists and make it better which includes analyzing the structure of the code the test suites as well as the way the teams and the workflows are organized to help them address a business need how his team focuses more on the craft then the urgency to ship something out very quickly he brings out this characterization of the mindsets for makers and menders in the software development space that it is not a binary but more of a spectrum that one can and may need to move in and out of and why he felt the need to have a co-founder and how he found the ideal partner in business and in life the process they have evolved over the years for inspection and understanding of the existing code using techniques such as cyclomatic complexity duplication of code code coverage churn etc to identify hot spots he also shares some career tips for people who would like to look at existing code and make it better lot of interesting things to learn listen on i want to segue a little bit moving yeah. away from the the deep technology aspects that we've been talking about uh into the the business side mm-hmm. so when did you feel that there was a business or there can be a company that works in this by the way i think we did not uh spend time in introducing the you know, corgi bites as to what corgi bites does so maybe if you can also share yeah the focus of yeah, corgi bites so- and yeah Yeah, so Corgibytes is a consultancy that exclusively helps companies with the software systems they already have. Only two or three times have we ever built a built an application from scratch, uh, and one of those is one that we're working on for ourselves. It's a it's an internal it's a, a product that we hope to to share with the with the world once we get enough of it built. Our specialty is taking something that already exists and making it better in some way, uh, and the motivations for making it better are. Uh, we try to always look at the business objective so what business objective is being solved by making this better uh and the sometimes the business objective has nothing to do with the software sometimes it's the team so we've had organizations come to us and they'll say that they have an aging code base and they are having difficulty staffing developers on it because uh the people who they're interviewing have no interest in working on it and they keep getting told over and over again that it's too old or that the people are worried about their resumes becoming stale right. and so they don't even want to they don't even want to join the company to work on the work on the project and so we end up uh helping them modernizing it to try to solve that problem to try to solve the retention issue in that case the business problem is 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 retention the business problem is is you know attracting uh software development talent uh and the state of the software system is is what is making it difficult to 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 achieve that goal. Other times it's performance or stability or security concerns or the rate of change. So what a lot of organizations will will notice is when they first get started and they've got that first experiment and that first new idea, uh they're able they're able to ship changes relatively quickly. They're able to 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 think of experiments and get results on those experiments relatively quickly. But then that pace 
of change starts to slow down. And they're kind of longing for the days when they used to be able to get turned around relatively quickly. And so we can help them investigate, like, why have things appeared to slow down? And, you know, can there be ways to make adjustments to either the way their teams are structured or the way the software is structured to kind of get some of that back? And, you know, some, sometimes it's, it's been an accumulation of technical debt. Sometimes it's been that the test suite is taking too long to run, right? And so finding ways to make the test suite run faster uh, because you have people who are making a change and then waiting on the test suite to, to tell them that everything's okay before, before they can move on. But it's really kind of like starting with that business problem, doing an investigation to figure out like what is causing that slowdown or what is causing uh, that that business problem to need to be addressed in the first place. And then, and then figuring out a, a way to make changes to either the software system or make suggestions to the way the team is structured to, to bring that change about. And so that's what, that's what we focus on. We, so if we're ever asked to like create a brand new app to solve a brand new problem that, you know, may or may not work, we're not the right fit for that. We tend to take too long. <laughs> We tend to focus too much on the craft of building something that that will last and and will work really well. When when you're trying to validate an idea, craft is less important than does it solve the problem. Like like I mentioned earlier, yeah. And so we've kind of segmented the the world of software developers into makers and menders. And through really informal surveys that we've given at conferences, like asking for show, shows of hands, it looks like. Uh, about five to ten percent of software developers out there uh, would identify as being a mender, uh, and as you know, someone who would prefer to work on those kinds of problems. We, we've had clients in the past who, after talking to us, um, they just looked at who they had on their teams, and they looked at their projects, and they looked at you know, kind of the the maker mender divide o- amongst those teams, and what kind of energy that project needed. You know, if the project needs maker energy, is it staffed full of menders? <laughs> and is that is that the right match? Or if the project needs mender energy and it's staffed with the makers, mm-hmm. is that the right match? And so sometimes moving people around based on based on that natural inclination can help a lot. So yeah, so we are a team of menders. Uh, that is that is what we're best at. We're best at mending things. We're best at that refinement work. I think we do uh, a really good job taking something that is at an uh, you know kind of an eighty percent. That 80% done part where uh, most makers will then want to move on. You know, they've solved 80% of the problem and now they're bored. They need a new problem (laughs) where we would really enjoy taking, taking that and then like finishing off that last 20%, which may take a long time. That last 20% often takes a very long time, right? That, that refinement work is kind of like the long tail. Sometimes you're, you're never done, right? But that's that's the kind of work that we enjoy doing. We enjoy seeing seeing those those improvements come to be. And if we were asked to to build that initial eighty percent, then we would be challenged. So so that's kind of you know what the you know, Corey Weiss as, as a company does is you know is that and we we embed ourselves on on teams. Sometimes we are the team. So if, if the company is small enough, then you know we end up being the dev team. Like if they've always outsourced their software development, uh, then you know they end up outsourcing it to us, and we kind of get things to a point where um, now maker energy is needed, and then we kind of pass the project off to to somebody else, uh, and then and then sometimes it comes back to us <laughs> when when mender energy is needed again. Yeah, that's very interesting. So when you started this as a business, what was the trigger or why did you feel the need for a co-founder or a partner? Oh, so I, um, I knew that I wanted like the independence of running my own company and I wanted that flexibility and I wanted to be able to structure the company in a way that could offer that flexibility and independence to others. But I didn't know how to do that. I didn't, I didn't know how to find clients. I didn't know how to do the marketing. I didn't know how to I didn't know how to do the sales. I didn't even know how to structure what should be sold. I didn't know it should it be a product company, should it be a consultancy. Uh, so very, very on, early on in Corgibyte's inception, before we kind of landed in on the, you know, we're going to do legacy code. I thought that I had a marketing problem, so I started started searching for solutions to to marketing the, the marketing problem that I thought I had, and I stumbled across uh, Andrea's blog at the time. 
And it, it just happened that I went to high school with Andrea. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, I reached out to her at, uh, I bumped into her at our, at her 10 year high school reunion mm-hmm. and uh, met with her the next day and started picking her brain about like, you know, what could I do? And she just had this flurry of ideas. She was like, you could, with your skills to, to, to kind of solve what you want to do. She just like, she like laid out this like 20 point plan and I couldn't even remember all of it. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed to just roll off of her, you know, with like no thinking. Like, mm-hmm. And she was like, oh, it's so easy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> um, and so that's when I said, you know, you know, I recognized and valued her skill set as being one that was valuable, one that I was lacking. Uh, and at the time I had, you know, the business had nothing to offer. Like there was like uh, literally pennies in the bank account <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, from where transactions had been tested to set up PayPal and things like that. <laughs> If she was willing to come on as CEO and co-founder, that you know, I would you know give her fifty-one percent because I would rather have fifty-one percent. I would rather have forty-nine percent of something than one hundred percent of nothing. And so, kind of recognizing that I I, I needed a, a, a co-founder, I needed somebody who had the expertise that I was lacking. Uh, it wasn't long after that you know we we got married and and, and, oh, nice. and you know, we've got we've got two two children together, but wow. you know it was it was very much this kind of recognition that I, I couldn't do it on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had seen a, I had seen an article by the folks at Y Combinator um, and they were talking about the kinds of businesses that they invest in. And this was back in like, say like 2005, 2006. Um, but they were talking about the kinds of businesses that they invest in. And they had this frequently asked questions section. And one of the frequently asked questions was, why don't you invest in single founder companies? And I thought their answer was really compelling. I remember their answer being that if you can't convince at least one other person to take this journey with you, to take that risk with you, to take that big step, then how are you ever going to convince a customer to, to buy your product? <laughs> so I, you know, from the time that I that I read that article, I I, I kind of knew that I needed I needed to be able to convince one other person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I felt like Andre was the first person who really believed in, in the idea that, that something could work, something could come of this. And we, uh, we kind of, we bumped around a lot trying to find the right, the right business model and the right, the right market to, to, to try to address. Like at first we, we tried building small websites and apps for, for companies. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I hate this. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and so that's, that then kind of motivated the discovery process of like, what did I like doing? Uh, because you know, if if the company that that we created had was turning into something that I that I hated doing, then what was the point, right? Just go get a job for somebody else and just like that. And so that's kind of where when we pivoted to only taking on projects that already existed mm-hmm. uh, and and needed that help. So the the first experiment with that approach, and we didn't like Andre was convinced that there were businesses out there that were going to need that. And she knew from talking to me and talking to other developers that most developers didn't like doing that work. So for her, with her her business and marketing background, from her, uh, you know, her degrees uh, in 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 business and marketing from from VCU, she remembered learning that like if you have something that everybody needs and nobody wants to do, then that's a that's an incredible opportunity. <laughs> but I didn't know if if people would be willing to buy, and I didn't, and I thought I might be the only crazy person who liked doing this work. So we kind of started out with just kind of pitching me as coming in, and I think one of our our first marketing. Uh, messages was I can come on un- F your project was the way that we phrased it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if your project is effed up, I can, I can, I can un F it. Right. Uh, and so I, then I started speaking at meetup groups and one thing I noticed at the meetup groups that I was speaking at, and I, I spoke at a lot of meetup groups up and down the East coast that year is I would, I would ask the question who here likes working on a project that they inherited from somebody else. Mm. And without fail, there would at least be one hand in the room that went up and it went up enthusiastically like, Mm. Oh, that's me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that person would come up to me afterwards and, and say like, I want to come work for work, work for you. I want to come work with you on these Mm -hmm. kind of problems. If like, if that's all you're going to be working on, then I want to do that too. So then that was like, okay, well, there are like, we could build a team (laughs) there. There's more than just me. Yeah. And then, and then it came down to finding organizations that would be, be willing to outsource that kind of work to another organization to, 
to get help. Uh, and that's proven a little more difficult. Uh, we, we, we've certainly found some, we've been successful. We've got, you know, uh, about, you know, our, our team size between software developers and, and, and not is about 18 at the moment. We're not super tiny, but we're not, we're not huge. Right. Uh, but that is a challenge that we run into a lot is a lot of organizations will either can't afford outside help because of their size or because mm -hmm. of their budget, or they feel like they can solve these problems internally. And so it, it you know, it's, it's finding the right organization that is, uh, you know, recognizes, recognizes that they, that they need help or that they want help and that they're willing to get it from outside the organization rather than, than inside the organization. That's kind of, kind of, it's kind of the, the business problem that, that, that we you know, kind of find ourselves solving. So finding those organizations and finding those, finding those companies on the talent side, we have not had a problem uh, for the most part. Uh, there are lots of folks who really, really like, you know, focusing on cleanup work and that, so that's been, that's been nice. So over the years with your experience, have you evolved any methodology or tools to make this process simpler? We have something that we do with most, most projects that we get started with. Um, it doesn't fit every project that comes our way, but it, it does fit probably, you know, 80 plus percent. Um, we kind of created a technical discovery process that we call a, a code inspection. And it's in, inspired by the, by the, the renovating a house metaphor, like mm -hmm. the kind of inspection you might get when you, when you buy a new house. Mm. And we look at that and we look at different software. We did look at different software quality metrics and we look at them uh, in comparison with each other. So mm -hmm. we look at cyclomatic complexity or cognitive complexity, depending on, on, what makes the most sense given the given the language? We look at duplication. So, how many times have have things been copied and pasted throughout the mm -hmm. throughout the code base? We look at test coverage. So, mm -hmm. um, how much of the code base is executed in in an automated uh, with an automated testing framework? Mm -hmm. And then we look at churn, which is a measure of uh, how many times has the code needed to change. And we look at this at a, at a per file level. Mm -hmm. And by looking at all those at the same time, we're able to kind of uh, identify hotspots. So if we see uh, a file in the code base that has, say, changed 300 times in the last three months, and it has the most complex method in the code base in it, uh, it has the worst coverage, and it, and that file has the highest duplication across the code base, that's a problem. <laughs> like that is an area that needs attention. Like there's there's probably a story behind why it's that way. But mm -hmm. that is a signal that something needs to change, right? And so then, you know, we don't try to make assumptions about like what needs to change or why it is that way, but it's more like this needs to be investigated. And then mm -hmm. we do uh, some of that investigation in the code inspection process. And we try to, we try to see like, are there practices that are, that are being followed? We also will, will dive in and look at uh, sections of the sections of the code base uh, in a kind of exploratory fashion. And trying to see if we can kind of spot patterns or or trends that the automated tools uh, don't identify. We look for evidence of different team practices that we think mm -hmm. uh, help yield uh, sustainable uh, software systems. And so we we look for the evidence of those of those things. We will look at the issue issue tracking system to see what kind of kinds of conversations are being had over there. We will look in the source control system to see, you know, what kind of conversations might be might be had over there. We look at the documentation that the team uses to support themselves. Um, if there is uh, customer facing documentation, then we, then we look at that as well. We try to set up a dev development environment and like, how difficult is that? Cause you know, one of the problems that we're often asked to take a peek at is um, there'll be organizations that have just received a, a large influx of funding. Mm -hmm. And they know they're going to hire, say, 100 new people, 100 new software developers in the next year. And they don't know if they can handle it. Yeah. And so one of the things we'll then look at is, you know, how long does it take to get one of those people productive mm -hmm. and then make some recommendations around that? And so, you know, that is the that is the kind of the, the process where we look at, like, what is the business need and what is the what is the business motivation for kind of making an improvement? And then we really kind of color all of our recommendations uh, through the, through the lens of what do they currently need. Yeah, and I, I would say like one common theme we've noticed on almost every project is we almost always make a recommendation that teams try to identify code that they can delete, and that you know kind of organizations organizations in general don't have enough 
knowledge about how their software is being used by their customers. They've built features and they've shipped features, but they don't really know if those features are being used. Yeah. I think if that data was more readily available, then uh, business leaders could make decisions about whether or not it makes sense to delete mm -hmm. some of those features and no longer have to uh, pay the price of, of keeping them working uh, right. and, and keeping them going. So that's a, that is definitely a, a theme that we see all the time is that teams need to need to delete more code, uh, identify code that's not being run anymore and delete yeah. it, identify features that aren't being used by your customers and delete them. Okay. Now, do you see any scope for AI based approaches to help with this kind of analysis? I, I'm sure there are. I am not familiar with the research into that. I during lockdown, I discovered that there is a in a town where I live. I, I live in the Richmond, Virginia area at Virginia Commonwealth University. They have a software maintenance lab where they do research around software maintenance activities. It's my hope to kind of get plugged into what that lab is focusing on from a mm -hmm. research research perspective. I imagine that there are researchers looking at you know, AI based approaches to maintenance activities. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there's likely a lot that can be done there. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the tooling that, that we've kind of identified need for, you know, could be tooling that could be created uh, and kind of, you know, driven in, in an AI way. So I, I do think there's, there, there's room, there's room for doing that, but I think it's going to take some research to kind of find those problems and find ways to train uh, AI models to come up with with solutions that'll 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 work. Uh, and one question that I like to ask all my guests is related to career advice mm -hmm. or two segments of people: someone who is probably starting out in IT and somebody who might be mid career. So the question is actually in two parts. One is this mentor mindset a trainable skill, and is there something that uh, one can get into? irrespective of what stage of one's career one is. Yeah, I think I think it likely, the mender mindset likely is trainable. And kind of what we've noticed is it, it's probably not binary. It's probably more of a spectrum. We've had people on our team who have worked on, you know, worked on projects that needed mender energy for like two years straight. And they're like craving making something from scratch, right? So I think, you know, there is, there are, for some folks, there's a limit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So kind of recognizing where you're at and what you're craving and then advocate for yourself, no matter at what point in your career you are, find someone within your organization who you can advocate to and kind of, and hopefully that person can be your advocate to the rest of the organization and just be honest with that person about the kinds of work that you're craving. You know, if you're craving maintenance work, let them know. And, and often, you know, there is someone in your organization who, who is there to help you and help you find things that are a good fit, no matter, no matter what point in your career you are, whether you're just starting out or you're, you know, you, you've, you've been there for a while, you know, kind of knowing what you like doing, making that known and trying to find an advocate uh, who can help you uh, help you find a match between what you like doing and what you are doing uh, is, is a really good idea. I think for just long-term happiness and kind of mental health in general. <laughs> yeah, great. That is very reassuring. So would it yeah. be more like a, a career as in an employment career or more like gig working? I think it could be either, you know? right? So I think I think there's certainly, if if I did not need to worry about like making a house payment or or money to eat, right? Like if, if, money, if money were not something that I had to worry about anymore, then I would probably be overjoyed uh, finding open source projects that have bugs that look interesting to me and just fixing them. Right. There, there is, if, if you like doing maintenance work, there's so much maintenance work out there that you can go find and just do, and you don't need permission to fix a bug on an open source project, right? Like the kind of permission you might need to fix a bug within your, within the organization you work in. So that could be an outlet if you're looking for a way to kind of stretch those muscles is to kind of, you know, find those projects. So it could be like, if your organization has 10% time, mm -hmm. so, you know, and they allow you to do training. Right, you could you could choose to spend your training budget fixing bugs on open source projects as a way to kind of scratch that itch. Oh, that's so. a great way to pay it forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on that very positive note, uh, Scott, uh, thank you for coming on the show and then sharing your story, experience, perspectives. 
Yeah, I take it that uh, there is definitely room for people like me who may be considered vintage in the industry to still productively contribute by yeah know, mending. Yeah, things. I think like like mending things or telling the story of why things mm -hmm. used to be done a certain way. Like yeah, like having that context and is is so valuable, right? Like just sharing insights, uh, mm -hmm. especially for people who don't yet have gray hair, right? Who mm -hmm. they haven't they're they're they they haven't they don't yet have the benefit of the wisdom that, that can come from working in software for 20 or 30 years. You know, just helping people understand what it used to be like. What were the constraints that folks had to deal with? And how might that have colored the way problems were solved? Mm -hmm. Like that's really valuable. And I think will always be valuable. So thanks a lot, Scott, once again. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs>